I'm Dr. Herbacio Lamas. I'm the principal investigator and study chairman of the TACT uh, trials. Uh, at this point, we have TACT, which was uh, published in 2013. We have TACT 2, which was funded in 2016. And we actually have TACT 3A, which was uh, started uh, just last year and uh, just began to enroll patients. So it really is a, um, uh, an entire research plan of uh, chelation therapy, um, editate disodium based. It's really been um, a journey uh, for me in the sense that uh, when I began um, to become interested in chelation was 20 years ago, actually in, 20, in um, in 1999. So this August, uh, next month, uh, will be 20 years. And I, um, I was interested in it initially because I thought that it was uh, an invalid medical treatment that was being used by patients and that should be tested to see if it was uh, safe. Um, but to be honest with you, I had assumed that it would be ineffective. So it took a few years to get funded for TAC-1, and it took 10 years to complete it. And at the end, I was quite surprised uh, that we were able to reduce cardiovascular events with EDTA-based uh, chelation therapy. Now, when we then looked at it even uh, more deeply, we found that the patients that seemed to receive the greatest benefit were patients with diabetes. So all the patients who were enrolled in TAC-1 were at least 50 years of age. They were non-smokers uh, for at least three months. They'd had a myocardial infarction or a heart attack uh, in the past. And they had creatinine of 2.0 or less. So at, at worst, they had fair renal function or better. And um, they were uh, randomly assigned to receive 40 infusions of chelation uh, over the course of a year plus, or uh, placebo, uh, again, over the course of a year plus, and the study was double-blinded. We enrolled 1,708 patients. We gave 55,222 infusions, roughly half and half active and placebo. And at the end, the curves diverged. No, that's actually a huge statement because there are six or 700,000 heart attacks in the U.S. every year. So if you're saying that in all comers who've had a heart attack um, and are at least 50 years of age, the majority of people with a heart attack, um, chelation could reduce the risk of recurrent coronary events by 18%, which is what we found, that would be an, an enormous uh, public health change and change in the way that we treat patients. Of course, when we had these results, which were unexpected, um, to me anyway, they were unexpected. To my colleagues in the um, chelation community, they were not unexpected. They, they actually breathed a sigh of relief, uh, but they expected all along that the study would be positive, which is, um, and we've formed some very warm uh, friendships over the years uh, over our different ways of looking at these things. Um, and you look at it and you say, okay, so why does this work? Why does the treatment that I give for a year, for a year and a half, um, end up having a beneficial effect the last up to five years at least? Because the curves kept diverging even after the treatment was stopped. And that's really where we go back to the chelation literature and understanding what EDTA does. And it removes toxic metals um, and allows the kidney to excrete them. So when you just do a simple experiment, uh, you take a 50-year-old post-MI patient, you measure what's in their urine, and you give them a tact infusion. Um, you measure what's in the urine again, uh, but the next day, you find that there is 
close to 4,000% more lead and about 700% more cadmium. So you're really turning that individual into a different human being. It's a human being who is now, after 40 infusions, walking around with fewer poisons in their body. These are poisons that have um, profound um, effects on human metabolism, potentially epigenetics or genetics. Um, it affects every aspect of the cell. Um, and it affects every aspect of the cardiovascular tree. So in that context, we then looked at subgroups, as I said, found that diabetics had, diabetic patients had the most extraordinary benefit. By extraordinary benefit, I mean a 43% reduction in death from any cause over the course of five years. Nothing does that. I mean, simply nothing. So um, we went to the FDA in 2014, and they said the study was positive, the drug is safe. This was um, kind of an upper level meeting uh, before there is a formal presentation. And they also said, you know, we don't like just seeing one study. You've got to do it again. And, um, you know, it's kind of like winning a championship boxing bout and telling you that you've got to go in the ring again in order to win again. It really, that really threw me. And so that was in 2014. Uh, you get thrown for a loop for a couple of weeks with these things. And then you start looking for money. And the people who have been the best scientists, the people who look at the data in an objective way and say, yeah, you got to do it again because this could have tremendous public health impact. You might save thousands of lives are the scientists from the National Institutes of Health. These are real public servants. I, I can't tell you um, how proud I am to have had the really the honor to be working with them on this. This could have never happened without, without their support. And their support is based on an objective and critical look at the data. So then, 2016, we receive another large grant along with Duke, who does all our statistics and data management, to start TAC2. TAC2 is in diabetic patients. That patients with diabetes who have had a prior MI and are at least 50 years of age, same kidney function stuff. So again, I'm in the middle of an unblind of a blinded study. I don't know what the results are. Maddening, absolutely maddening. I was blinded for 10 years intact. Now I'm blinded for um, however long it takes us to finish TAC two. Should be probably in 2022 that we'll finish, in about three years. I can tell you we've enrolled over 700 patients. We need to enroll about 1,200, so we'll, we're well on our way. And we need patients. We really need patients. So that's um, a critical aspect at this phase of enrollment uh, of the trial is getting to target. In the meantime, uh, we try not to let um, you know grass grow under our uh, feet. And when I spoke with my chelation uh, colleagues and friends, they had always said, look, you have to study peripheral artery disease. And then, so I had a small grant um, from the um, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Carter's foundation after his uh, after he passed away. Some additional funds were made available to me by our hospital, who actually looked at things objectively and believed the data. And we enrolled in an open label way uh, ten patients who had critical limb ischemia, so severe vascular disease of the extremities of the lower extremities. Uh, even with gangrene. Of those patients, four of them had gangrene. 
and we were able to save their legs. Um, I've never seen such a thing. Um, to the point that of those patients, two of them, the family was so impressed that they refused to stop the study. The, the trial itself, the, the clinical study had 50 infusions that were included uh, free uh, because it was um, an experiment done under the same FDA license. Um, and then they refused. They went then to a chelation practitioner to continue uh, receiving chelation because the patients had done so well. That we're trying to get published now. That's been published as an abstract. And uh, some of the criticism that we get back uh, from different journals is, well, maybe this happened spontaneously. Well, I mean, that's obviously nonsense. Um, this is a biologically active uh, material. It's really quite extraordinary. And I think that we are on the road, on the road to being able to bring, to recognize that there are risk factors. It's not all cholesterol. It's not all stenting. It's not all antiplatelet drugs. There is far more to atherosclerosis than meets the, than meets the eye. So with the evidence from that small open label uh, 10 patient study, I was able to go to a local foundation in Miami and to a very generous uh, donor uh, who happened to be my patient. And we were able to acquire enough money to do a randomized trial of 50 patients. And I called it TAC 3A because I'm expecting that TAC 3 will be a two or 300 patient study of uh, um, chelation study of patients with severe peripheral artery disease. This is A, um, is its little brother, and it will guide us in planning a bigger one. So tax 3 a is just starting. Um, we really are enrolling patients with critical limb ischemia. Some of them have gangrene, and uh, they're diabetic. They have bad diabetes. Um, Non-smoker for at least three months, and again, in this one, it's a single center study, so at Mount Sinai in Miami Beach, we need patients. At the end of it all, I think that we are nearing, we are sort of, we're at the end of the beginning, um, but we are far from uh, the beginning of the end of showing that uh, this molecule um, should be used uh, for patients who have severe vascular disease, a heart attack, diabetes, peripheral artery disease, and should be an adjunct to standard, more standard medications uh, such as aspirin, statins, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors. So it's, these are exciting times. They are, um, they are always, um, uh, there's always pressure uh, to enroll, pressure to keep patients on the, on the study, pressure to make sure that you can meet your budget. Science is not just science. Science is also money. Uh, but with our, uh, our scientists at uh, the National Institutes of Health that are behind us, with other scientists that are uh, measuring metals and maintaining a biorepository, um, yeah, at Columbia, with the scientists at Duke backing us up, we're going to get there. We're 20 years in this road. It's not. This is not 20 years away. Uh, we'll get there. And I thank ACAM. ACAM was truly in the beginning, and it's all the way through TAC1, an extraordinary supporter. Uh, without ACAM, ACAM's support in the beginning of the study, in the beginning of this, which is really way back now to 2000, 2001, we would not be here. This treatment would still be practiced only by chelation practitioners, and chelation practitioners would continue to be harried by conventional physicians. We now have data. And that's, uh, 
I say thank you, ACAM. The, the lifeblood of clinical trials is patient recruitment. And we are looking for a site that will be able to recruit patients, bring them into the study, randomize them, follow study protocols. And I suggest that you can reach me if you believe that you can uh, provide this. Um, we should have a conversation. And I'll let you know that um, this is a job that you do for love. You don't do it for money. Um, and what it takes, and then you can decide if you love it or not.